regulatory items, I have been notified of none. So we now come to the, um, the substantive items on the agenda. And uh, you'll be aware that we are according uh, precedence to item number 13, uh, Auckland's response to the 2019-2020 uh, drought. Um, Ravine Jadaram, uh, I hope, is joining us on the line. Uh, Ravine and uh, Mark Bourne, are you uh, are you on the line at the moment? Good morning, Mayor Goff and councillors. Yes, I, uh, we are. We are in the same room, but we have physical distancing, Mark Bourne and myself. Yes. Okay, and you got back to Newmarket in time this morning as well, so that's um, that's pretty good. I won't accuse you of speeding. Um, no, no traffic <laughs> on the road. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we also should, uh, just to check, actually I'm going to do a roll call, I think, because um, I need to do that uh, before Sandra growls at me. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, school's back in at the moment. Um, so we'll run through the list. Um, Deputy Mayor Bill Cashmore. Present, sir. And Councillors uh, Josephine Bartley. Morena. Cathy Casey. Morena, Phil. Uh, Afeso Collins. Taloha, Mayor. Pippa Coom. Kia ora, Mr Mayor. Linda Cooper. Yeah, and I didn't speed back to Westall. <laughs> I, I withdrew that accusation. Uh, uh, Angela Dalton. Present, Your Worship. Uh, Chris Darby. Marina Mayor and members. Elf Filipina. Uh, gift, Your Worship. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Chris Fletcher. Chris, are you on the line with us? Okay, I'll just get Sandra to, to, to check up um, where Chris is at at the moment. Uh, to Henare. Kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, Shane Henderson. Present, sir. <laughs> Richard Hills. Morning. Tracy Mulholland. Present. Daniel Newman. Good morning, Your Worship. Greg Sayers. Sorry, uh, yes, present. Thank you. Thank you. There must be a time delay coming coming down from Rodney. Um, Desley Simpson. Present, sir. Sharon Stewart. Yes, I'm here, thank you. David Taipere. Kia ora, Your Worship. Kia ora. Uh, Wayne Walker. I know you're there, Wayne. Come on. We've heard him already before. Yeah, that's why I know he's there. Um, we, we might have um, lost. We'll come back to, to, to Wayne. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, John uh, Watson. Talofa. Talofa. Uh, Paul Young. Paul. Uh, we, we may have lost Paul just for a moment, but I think he'll be back on uh, in, in a minute. Okay, uh, coming coming back to uh, item number 13. Sorry. Uh, Chris Fletcher present. I was having technology problems too. Thank you. I had that problem with the workshop yesterday, Chris, um, where you. my microphone refused to work. Um, so we'll just double check. We've got our officers here. Sarah Holdham. Sarah, are you on the line? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I'm here. And Alistair Cameron. Alistair, are you with us? Sarah, it might be a solo act uh, from you um, yeah. at, at this point. Um, look, uh, I think all of us are aware um, of the necessity for what we're looking at this morning. Um, we've uh, I just looked at the NIWA records. Uh, we had 77 days, I think, in a row uh, without uh, rain. We had half the normal rainfall uh, for the uh, January to April period. In fact, that period was the driest ever in the history of the city. And uh, we've been waiting for the rain, and we got a little bit last uh, weekend, at, I think about um, uh, 50, 50 mils over the Hunua range, uh, where, up where I live, and that was welcome. Uh, but it only had a marginal impact. It, it probably held up the, um, for, a, for a couple of days the, the, the continuing fall in the level of the lakes. We're now at 46%. Um, uh, on average, uh, we'd be at 76% at, um, for this time of the year. Um, we are not yet in a crisis, but we are definitely in a critical situation. 
Um, a crisis perhaps can be defined by what happened in 93, 94, um, before we had the uh, intake from the Waikato, where at one stage we dipped to 29% uh, of the lake capacity. Uh, so we, we, we clearly have to take actions over and above um, the quite effective campaign that Watercare has run to date for voluntary savings. Um, but what we're doing today um, is asking for a, a mandatory restriction at stage one that's uh, not draconian, but if we get to stage three, that will have, that will have huge implications. So we need to take action now to, to head off what we might otherwise face. Now, um, I think uh, we've, you've got the, the paper in front of you and you've seen the recommendations. Um, uh, I'll, I'll move the recommendations and perhaps ask uh, Linda Cooper if you could second it, please. Yes, yes, Your Worship, I'll second that. And I just want to say um, thank you to Sarah for doing quite a lot of work on this report. Yeah, thank you. It's, um, it has evolved uh, for those of us saw, that saw it at the early stages quite considerably, and it's now quite full, uh, and uh, I think it serves its purpose. Um, now, I think um, perhaps if we lead off with, uh, with Ravine uh, Jadaram to give us a background, and then I'll ask, uh, uh, and, and Mark, if he, he wishes to contribute to that. I think we've got a, um, a slideshow that will uh, present graphically where we are at the moment, uh, which is really useful. And then, Sarah, I'll ask you to come in if, and to see if there's anything that you'd like to add before we move to questions and comments. So, Ravine, uh, welcome, and Mark, um, and... Uh, uh, please begin your presentation. Thank you, Mayor Goff. I, I'm going to ask Mark to do the whole presentation. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Your Worship and, uh, and Council members. Uh, um, Ravina and I are dialing in on a telephone call, so we don't have the uh, uh, advantage of a video in front of us, but I'm hoping that you're able to see a slideshow, and I'm assuming we're on the title page of that slideshow. Can I just have... And we, that, yep, yeah, we've got the title page oh, there, fantastic. and if, uh, Sandra is operating the slideshow, I think. I'm just double checking. Fantastic. That so so if, if we you just say, you, yes. if you could just say at each point when you want the new slide up, uh, she or she'll put it up on the screen. Perfect. Thank you very much. If we can move to the uh, second slide, please, and it should be titled uh, um, "Cumulative um, Rainfall in the Waitakere Ranges." Yep. And on that slide, what the, it, it's quite important really to understand why we're in uh, the situation we're in. And what this uh, uh, slide pack is going to talk a little bit about, it'll pick the highlights of the paper and provide a little bit of background context. So on this first slide, the dark uh, black line indicates the cumulative rainfall that we would normally receive uh, uh, during the course of a summer year, starting in November and ending in, in the following December. And so as you move from the left-hand side of the page to the right-hand side of the page, it's the cumulative amount of rainfall that would occur each month. And the, um, the other lines on there represent in purple the last significant drought that we had in the Auckland region in 1993-94. The green line, last year's rainfall, and then the red line at the bottom, the cumulative rain, amount of rainfall that's occurred this uh, year. And what um, that's indicating, what that's clearly showing, is significantly less rainfall being received in the Waitakere Ranges this year compared to normal, but perhaps more concerning, less than what's been received compared to the 1993-94 drought. And certainly, as we heard this morning, uh, this is certainly shaping up to be the worst drought in Auckland's living memory. Perhaps if we move to the next slide, please, which is the Hunua rainfall. Same colour scheme, same graph, but this is where uh, most of Auckland's water is stored in the Hinua Ranges. About 60% of our total water storage is within the, in the Hinua Ranges, so it's really the bank of where our water comes from. Now, this lack of rainfall has broken all records. It was the driest period from January to February, and uh, we've just had confirmation from Niwa uh, yesterday that this is also the driest period from January to April since records began. And overall, we've received only 34% of our normal rainfall. So if we can move to the next slide, please, which is headed up Auckland drought. And I'll just talk to a couple of uh, points on this, this slide. Uh, um, 
I think due to the lack of rainfall and the incredibly hot, dry and you know, enjoyable summer that we've had, we saw extremely high water demands over that summer period. And we had individual days where we uh, broke our prior record and got up to 560 million litres of water being consumed. And that was at that point that Watercare commenced the uh, drought management plan and commenced the advertising campaign in early February to encourage uh, demand reduction. That demand reduction has been successful and during the summer period demand was reduced. And then more recently during the, uh, the lot level four lockdown, demands got down as low as um, 430 and in individual days even less than that. Um, I think I'll move on. Oh, the, uh, uh, the other thing I'll just touch on that, that uh, slide is it's going to take a significant wet winter to replenish the uh, dam storage levels back to where they would be uh, uh, for normal. And as, di as indicated on the, um, the slide, you'll see the blue line represents what we would expect normal lake levels to be. And you'll note that in the uh, beginning of this summer, lake levels were just marginally below where, we'd, where we would normally expect them to be. However, the forecast that we've received from both uh, uh, weather agencies, the Met Service and from NIWA, indicate that the coming three-month period is going to be less than or up to normal rainfall. Perhaps if we can move to the next slide, please, which is headed up, water care response to the drought. Watercare has a drought management plan that prepare that provides a suite of intervention uh, uh, that we would utilise to respond to the drought. And, and the first lever that we would look to pull is on the supply side. Now, the supply side helps to increase the supply of water. So since June of 2019, we've maximised the abstraction from the Waikato River Water Treatment Plant and the only hunger aquifer. It's an underground source in, um, in Onihanga, and together they can supply up to 170 million litres of water per day. We've continued to expand the Waikato water treatment plant, and in fact we've accelerated the completion of that project, and later this month we'll be able to increase abstraction up from the 150 million litres a day maximum to 160, and by August we'll be able to produce 100. 75 million litres from that facility. We're also bringing back into service the Hayes Creek Dam and the a Small Bore in Papakura. Both those plants were proposed to be brought back in the future and we've accelerated that work. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later on. And one of the other early interventions we did when we moved in as lake levels reduced was to reduce the compensation flows that are released from the Cossies Wire or and Watafari dams. Perhaps if we can move to the next slide, please, which also is headed up response to the drought, but this one talks about the second lever, and that is the demand side and reducing water demand. So that commenced on the 10th of February when the Water is Precious campaign started. There was a significant media campaign across uh, social media platforms and traditional media platforms. I think we've, we've lost you there a bit, Mark, uh, but we've just got you back. So, yeah, keep going. Uh, oh, my apologies. Uh, um, uh, so, so I'll just repeat, on the 10th of February, the uh, uh, voluntary water savings campaign started. It was a significant media campaign across uh, all media, both social media and traditional media. It focused both on outdoor water consumption but also voluntary measures people can take inside the home. And uh, those voluntary measures are particularly important over the coming winter months. Um, the other thing I'd just like to touch on as well is the significant amount of proactive work that's been undertaken with our uh, top 100 large industrial cu customers. And they will be uh, subject to uh, the same level of uh, savings, albeit on a voluntary level, as we're asking our residential customers to do. And as we experienced in the 93-94 drought, significant contribution was made from that customer segment. I'd like to move to the next slide, please, which is headed up Metropolitan Drought Management Plan and Water Use Restrictions. Now, whilst formal restrictions, which is the subject of this meeting, target outdoor usage, 
it's really important to note that um, uh, the savings over the winter months are really going to be coming from the more voluntary aspects that the community is going to take by undertaking habitual changes as to how they use water, taking shorter showers, ensuring that water appliances are only used when they're full, and in particular those industrial customers which I talked about. Interestingly, Auckland Council is one of our largest customers. In fact, they're our second largest customer and perhaps one of the more visible water users, particularly around parks and recreational activities. And our um, customer services team have been working with their counterparts at Council and to make sure that they were aware of the situation and were being seen as a leader in this area. And the response we've, we've had has been overwhelming support and I thank Council team for that. However, we're at the situation now where a series of staged restrictions are becoming important as we move through to winter and the rain that was originally projected is just not arriving. Perhaps if we can move to the next slide, which is headed up water use restrictions. And I understand, I, I do realise that it would be extremely difficult to read that and I wasn't going to dwell on, on, on these restrictions. The restrictions are covered in the paper and that's the subject of this. Um, this meeting. So I'll just move directly on to the uh, second to last slide which is headed up water use restrictions. And um, so when would these restrictions be implemented? The restrictions come in at different stages according to trigger levels that are established in the drought management plan. The trigger levels are seasonally adjusted based on dam uh, water storage levels. And it's proposed that the first stage of uh, mandatory restrictions come into place on the 16th of May, which allows for a reasonable period of public notification. Now those formal mandatory restrictions would cover all customers drawing water from the Metropolitan uh, uh, Water Supply System, which starts from the south at Pukekohe, Patamahoe and Clark's Beach out to Glenbrook's Beach, right the way up through the city from Drury to Wairera in the north, and includes out in Huia Village and also slightly outlying uh, Kumu and Riverhead as well. However, these mandatory restrictions wouldn't cover the, the uh, separated uh, areas, in particular communities such as Walkworth, which has a new uh, water supply scheme with a deep aquifer that has not uh, responded uh, to the drought at this stage. However, the public messaging and the advertising campaign will be region-wide to avoid confusion because we think it's beneficial that everyone reduces water consumption. And a probably uh, uh, an obvious question is, you know, how long will these restrictions be in place for and when will, they will be, when will they be withdrawn? Well, that really does depend on rainfall and, then, and drought storage levels. So once again, in accordance with the drought management plan as uh, stage uh, restrictions are implemented, the staged restrictions would be uh, reduced. And then perhaps if we move to the very last slide in the back please. Um, the the uh, restrictions come into being in accordance with the uh, water supply uh, bylaw which Council has jurisdictions over and Watercare is seeking uh, Council to delegate enforcement and compliance to Watercare. Now that compliance would be undertaken in accordance with Council's compliance policy and very much a focus on education first. However, the bylaw does provide a, a, a stick, if you were, uh, uh, for anyone that was you know, clearly flouting um, the, the requirements that are being set. But we would be working very progress, uh, proactively with Council's compliance and enforcement team if that was ever required. Now, the drought uh, uh, affects all of us or 1.7 million users, but the focus of these restrictions in the main is on residential outdoor use. However, some industrial activities will be affected at stage one and progressively more as if and when further stages were required. And Ravine and I are more than happy to take questions if that's appropriate at some point. Thank you very much, Mark. That, that was a very good presentation and very clear. I think we all understand uh, the nature of the problem and what you're doing to try to address it. Uh, Sarah, would you like to um, add anything further at this point in terms of the paper in front of us and the recommendations? Um, 
Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't really have a, a lot more to add. The only thing I would say is that, um, so although it's Watercare's Drought Management Plan, um, and which uh, Mike has just done a presentation on, so you as the Emergency Committee are required to impose those water restrictions under the bylaw. Um, and so the paper you're considering is about whether it's a good idea to approve those water restrictions and to delegate that enforcement power to uh, water care. Um, and also just noting we have on the line um, Kate Morrison from Public Law and Christian Brown from Regulatory who answer any questions that might come up. Thank you very much, Sarah. Well, look, um, what I'm going to do at this stage, um, we'll take questions and comments together, uh, but rather than doing the roll call uh, experimentally, um, I'll just get you to uh, indicate um, maybe on the sidebar um, or, or text to, to Sandra if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to make. So I have the uh, first one up there, which is uh, Councillor Desley Simpson. Oh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Watercare, for your presentation. Look, you know, where some of us get out and, and, and appreciate the wonderful fine weather we've had, the impacts of that, of course, are, are slightly different from your perspective. Look, my question is around um, businesses such as car washing businesses, house washing businesses, commercial water blasting businesses, etc. They've been really hit over... Uh, the COVID-19 lockdown for anyway. And of course, this is going to be another really bad hit for these people as well. What direct communication um, are you having with these people? And is there any offer of assistance available? Yes, it's Mark Bourne here, so I'll uh, answer that question. We are uh, attempting to communicate uh, with each of those customers where they are a direct customer of ours and we know about them. Uh, and we're also using uh, various business directories to assist us for uh, organisations that might not be a direct customer of us. So, so that if, if the restrictions are um, adopted by council, that we will be able to advise them in advance. And then we'll be working, looking to work directly with them in the first instance to identify if non-potable sources of water are appropriate for their activities or whether there's other opportunities that they can look to do. What, one of the things I, I was involved in the uh, drought uh, response in 93, 94, and at that time, similarly, car washing um, was restricted. And what we found was that a number of organisations introduced uh, recycling when that was something that wasn't available uh, when we went into that drought. So, so I'm confident the community will respond and there may well be new forms of technologies or new responses that we're unaware of at the moment. But in the first instance, we're working with Council's Healthy Waters team and they are to be assisting providing non-potable sources and the idea is to find those throughout the region to limit support costs. Thank you. Um, can, whoever's got their mic on, please, and doing their dishes, can you please turn your mic off? Um, <clears throat> we know your house proud, but we don't want to hear about it. Um, so please turn the mic off, everybody, unless you're speaking. Um, look, that experiment um, it was stillborn. Um, everybody wants to ask a question or make a comment, so I'm just going to revert to um, going down the list, which is probably uh, simpler. So we'll start at the top of the list. Um, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. No, I'm all clear, Mr Mayor. This needs to happen. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bartley. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you, Mark and uh, Ravine. I have um, some questions. I wanted to know, Mark, since you were involved in the 93-94 drought response, um, do you think we've done enough over the 26 years since the last drought? If so, why? And if not, what else could we do? And then I also wanted to know, in terms of the wider public comms and the education, can we also put out there what people do instead? Um, you know, because I'm just picturing people going down to the beach with buckets of water so they can come back and do something with it. So, yeah, something, uh, education and, and my first question, please. Thank you. No, no problems. I'll uh, just pick them up in, in order. Uh, so uh, a significant amount ha has occurred of change since the drought in 93-94. And perhaps the most visible of that is uh, water care in the Auckland uh, region now has a secure water source that's not affected by the same droughts that affect our water storage lakes in the Waitakere's and the Hunua Ranges, and that's the Waikato River. So the Waikato River source provides, in round numbers, about 30% of our daily requirements. 
and Watercare has planned to increase the capacity of that, of that source. That uh, supply increase from a growth perspective isn't required for about five or six years, but plans are in place to ensure that that's available <laughs> when required. The other thing that, that is quite different is, and this is going to be a little, um, perhaps a little complicated to understand, but the resilience of the system has actually improved. When we went into the drought in 1993-94, the system was designed to cope with a drought that would occur on average once every 50 years, whereas the system now is designed to cope with a much more severe drought, a drought that occurs once every 200 years. The challenge we face, and as I mentioned earlier, this is shaping up to be the worst drought on, on our records. So we don't know the severity of a drought until it's over. So the, the restrictions and the voluntary savings we're asking for have to be put in place early to preserve water. Uh, and, and then the uh, second question was around water use. Uh, once again, prior to 1993-94, Aucklanders you know, were reasonable with the amount of water they used, but we were you know, also quite wasteful. So on a, despite the fact that population has grown, the amount of water consumed by each of us individually is substantially less than what it was in 93-94. In fact, when you look at the survey undertaken by Water New Zealand last year, water care is an outlier, sorry, water care, Auckland, Aucklanders are an outlier. We're at the very low end of water consumption. We use 157 litres per person per day, whereas the average is 268 litres, sorry, 263 litres per person per day. And that's just in, in households. And the last question around communications, uh, um, the communications campaign has been significant over summer and will be ramping up over the winter months. Thank you. Um, thank you. But my question was about what can we can we put some information out there for people about what they do instead. And so don't clean your car on the front lawn. Yeah, you can tell them what you don't do. But for some people, they do things because they don't know it any better. So I'm just asking you to put some information out there about what you do instead. Then, like collect rainwater and use that to water your plants, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, we we will do that. It's Ravine here. Thank you, Councillor. We have a, a, a website that we set up particularly for this in February. It's called waterforlife.org.nz and it's got all the tips about how we should treat water as a precious resource all the time. So I would suggest uh, that that's a good website to, to use if you're talking to your constituents, but we will take on board with your suggestion. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. <clears throat> um, can I just throw in a question here um, to Mark or Ravine? Um, you know, we, I've seen uh, you describe this as a one in a hundred year drought, Ravine, and that would certainly have been the case in the past, uh, but with climate change, um, this may not be a one in a hundred year drought. It may become the norm rather than the exception. So <clears throat> could, um, could Mark or Ravine just take us through what the long-term steps are to improve our water resilience, and I'm really asking about um, the what the consent, the, the long-term consent, seven-year consent that's been uh, uh, in the in the wings for the Waikato District Council to draw more uh, water from uh, the Waikato. I think another 200 million litres. Um, would that solve the problem? Um, what have we looked at in terms of recycling wastewater through Mangere? What have we looked at in terms of desalination? Uh, what, have we, what, what extra are you doing now to, to deal with leakages? We knew leakages were running at about 13%. And finally, um, it's a question probably not only to Watercare but to ourselves. How can we encourage more people uh, to conserve the rainwater that falls on their roof so that they can use that to store water over the, uh, the winter and take some of the edge off the demand in the summer, uh, watering their garden from that source? So um, those questions about the, the long-term resilience uh, of water supply in Auckland, please. Thank you, Mayor Goff. It's Ravine here. Uh, we will be having a discussion with the board the board will probably want to do a review as well because we learn from the reviews. Uh, the reality is that the climate is different. So we believe, for example, the graph that Ma Mark had shown earlier 
the situation started last year when we had a very dry um, summer last year. And then even though we had the rainfall, it only got to 89% storage. We only got to that for only a little while before it started dropping again. So we have uh, what I would call a prolonged drought over two years, and it could go longer. We, we don't know because the drought hasn't ended. The Auckland water supply system historically has been based around um, maybe an annual drought that we get rain. It rains all the time. So the storage we have in our lakes, if we had no rain at all, is equivalent to about eight months of storage. That's all. We, we don't have large storages. So the bank that we have is very small. Um, so Waikato is a part of the, the um, solution. If we have about 300 megaliters of water coming from Waikato, that will give, you, give us some degree of resilience. But we have to look at all the other options from a supply side. And so that would include the reuse re of uh, purified wastewater. That would be an option for us. Desalination is always an option, but desalination takes a lot of energy and it would be counter to our carbon objectives, but it will still be on, on the plate as an option. So we will be looking at all those options uh, in light of the climate change challenge rather than just the population and demand challenge. So we've got to do that and we will be doing that. And I think we are seriously looking at behavior changes. You know, the, as Mark said, the demand per capita is around 157 liters per person per day. But what we found was as soon as we got into the dry summer months this year, it went up beyond 200 liters per person per day. And that's the challenge, that the behavior changes are not locked in when we get into a dry season. So we've got some more work to do there. We have real opportunities uh, collectively as a council family to look at how we can have rainwater tanks and how can we enable that uh, through resource management and building act requirements, making, making it more easier for uh, householders to put tanks, especially when new houses are being built, if they can already come in with rainwater tanks, which will help not only water supply, it will also help healthy waters and council in terms of stormwater retention, and it will help the customers as well because they'll be more environmentally conscious about the fact and more prudent in their water use. So the answer to your question, uh, Mayor Goff, is a lot has to be done and we have to change our mindset as to how we approach this problem for the future. Thank, thank you very much uh, for that, Ravine. Um, Cathy Casey. Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, thanks, Mark and Ravine. My questions relate to enforcement, and you had a slide on enforcement in your presentation. I'm particularly interested in the penalties and how people report breaches, and I'm also interested in the enforcement. How do you do that? I'll, I'll, Mark, here, I'll take that question. So, so um, the enforcement will be graduated, and as it says in the slide pack, we will be consistent with the council policy. But in terms of um, how we will know about those breaches, I think in the first instance, um, 1.7 million Aucklanders out there will be helping us. We really want to engage with Aucklanders. If all of us save a little, a significant amount of water will be saved um, cumulatively. So I think we will be very reliant on neighbours watching neighbours and the hope in the first instance they just talk to each other and point out the fact that um, we're in a, in, a, in a drought and the activity should cease. However, if that's not the case, we will have uh, um, uh, uh, dedicated uh, contact channels, both telephone, web and social media channels available for people to report. In the first instance, we will contact those people that are not following the rules and it will be education first. Um, however, we will be uh, tracking uh, uh, anybody that is uh, flouting those rules and has been warned more than several times. Ultimately, though, the bylaw provides a punitive damage of uh, up to $20,000 fine, but that would certainly be the, um, the, the, the last resort. 
Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. 1.6 million unpaid enforcement officers. That, uh, that sounds pretty good. Um, Councillor Collins. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Just a, a couple of things, and I appreciate you already asking about desalination and, and reusing our water as well. I'm just wondering, Mark, I'm um, intrigued by those figures and how Auckland is our outliers when uh, the national survey showed that we don't use as much water uh, per household uh, than others. Do, is it, does that make the, the task more difficult for you when Aucklanders are already using less water? And they'll be thinking, well, what the heck more do you want us to do when we're using close to 100 litres less than others throughout the country? And I have just one other question. Sure, I, it's a very observant question, and it's one that we've, we've taxed ourselves in developing the drought management plan. Uh, um, but, but I think it also goes to what volume of savings are we really targeting? So right now in stage one, cumulatively, so across the region, all water consumption, we're looking to reduce it by 5%. So, so yeah, it's, you know, cumulatively, it's not a huge amount. Now, we do expect some people will be able to make significant savings. Uh, uh, in my own household, I've managed to reduce my consumption uh, uh, from in a, in a winter month by 30%, and that's not made any changes to um, our activities around the home other than habitual changes. Um, so, so we do think that some people will be able to save a lot more than other, others but cumulatively we're only looking for a 5% savings. Um, the, I think the reason why Aucklanders are so much more efficient with water consumption than other communities around New Zealand is because we pay for it by use. And so there's a real benefit if someone reduces consumption, they'll pay less both in their water supply but also in their wastewater provision as well. But you are quite right, it does make it somewhat more challenging uh, going forward. Yeah, that's great. And just uh, finally, good, good, uh, good point there. Are there, are there kind of, can you, can you get down to the geographic areas of Auckland where you could say, let's say uh, Māngere has really low uh, water use and people are doing their best. Can, can you promote, you know, often we go after the, the parts of Auckland that, that, that might be naughty, but can we promote areas that are saying, look, they're doing great things in Māngere, here's some ideas, because I wonder if we take a positive, proactive approach, if that would be a, a, a way to, to really connect with Aucklanders. If there are good geographic areas where we can say, yeah, these parts of Auckland are doing a great job, let's, uh, let's use them as a benchmark. Uh, we, we certainly have the uh, technology to be able to do that. So our uh, way our distribution system works, we meter the amount of water that we take from the environment, we meter and measure the amount of water that we produce at our treatment plants, but then also we measure the amount of water that's consumed in each suburb, and then finally we measure the amount that's consumed by each customer. So yes, over time we could certainly build up patterns to uh, identify areas where uh, large uh, savings and reductions are being made. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Pippacoon. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Mark and Ravine, for the presentation and absolutely support the need for immediate restrictions. In some regards, the Mayor has asked my question because um, it is really focused on what we're doing to incentivise a climate resilient water supply. And I just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that on Tuesday, the Waitamata Local Board passed a resolution with quite um, detailed recommendations about what we could be doing to put in place more resilient water um, st strategy. So I think I heard from the answer to the Mayor that there is a work program focused on that and it would really be good to hear that that work's getting advanced, particularly around promoting um, rainwater collection and the options there. So that's more of a comment than a really a question, but because I think it has been answered, but maybe you could confirm that. And then I just had a, a further question, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Yep, we can confirm that there's, there's a series of things that have to be done, Councillor, uh, including something that I haven't mentioned, and that is that we need uh, some legislation and regulatory changes in New Zealand. Uh, so you may be aware that uh, the old Auckland City Council put in a purple pipe system in stone fields uh, so that rainwater could be used. 
and that is not being used because New Zealand does not have legislation on purple pipe systems. So we are putting together, the board has requested that we put together a comprehensive list of things that can be done uh, by water care and, and by Auckland Council and healthy waters so that we can be uh, more sustainable and more future fit. So that, yes, there is a program that we will be working on. Great. And I'll make sure, I mean, the notice of motion will be getting to you, but it does, I'll echo one of the, the comments it makes, is it does um, thank Watercare for the excellent work that has been underway to ensure that we do have a supply of water during this extended drought. Um, just, a, just a further question, in terms of the consumption and the amount that we're consuming, is is a big percentage of that... Um, as a result of water being bottled, and do we have any big do we have big demands from companies that are bottling our water, whether they're sending that overseas or for internal consumption? So the big demand we had in summer, where you know we got up to 560 megalitres a day, we believe that was a lot of uh, outdoor use by our mum and dad customers, ourselves, and uh, that is what our campaign was targeting. It was saying, you know, we, we are very good at using water. Generally, it's around 157, and during summer, it would have been probably 160, 165, 170, but it, it shot up over 200. So that's where the big demand came from. In terms of uh, companies that are bottling water, yes, there are, there are lots of companies in Auckland that bottle water. Some just bottle water and put it on the customer shelves uh, in the supermarkets and people buy it, not realizing that they're paying a fortune for what they can get on the tap, from the tap. There, it's, it's a straight bottling and selling on the shelves. <laughs> Others uh, add value to it, you know, whether they make Coca-Cola or beer or, or other things. but. Large volumes of water is used in the food and beverage area, and a lot of that would probably be exported as well. Is it possible to get some percentages around that and just to break it down? Does, just, is that something I could take offline to get some more information? Oh, we, we can do that. It's a very insignificant volume, but we can do that. We'll take it offline. We'll get it to you. Yeah. Thank you, and thanks for your work. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Linda Cooper. To me, I guess the thing here is, is that um, we do need to be looking at how, if this becomes the norm, how do we deal with that? But, but what we're looking at today is, um, do we actually put these restrictions um, in place? And I absolutely think it's the right thing to do. And it fits completely with, um, as Mark said earlier, our graduated approach as a council. We don't go into people's showers um, and, and tying them and things like that. But um, we certainly um, can look at the outdoor stuff, but we won't be... Um, we will be educating people before we would ever um, sanction them and I think that's the best approach and it does sort of sweep up those people who for some reason don't know about this um, and there will be those people. Um, we know it's hard to communicate with everybody but I think the communication has been excellent up to now and it actually has driven savings and I really do think we can save more. We're awfully extravagant with water um, in, in, in Auckland because we, we think we've got plenty of it for the most part and we've never really been in a bad um, situation. We've lost you, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I'd, I'd lost you there. I thought sorry. you'd finished. Um, no, 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 please continue. So, yeah. so I think that because we have taken water for granted for quite a long time as a general population in Auckland because we think it rains every day, um, we do need to be more careful. We can save more without significantly changing our life or de uh, having detrimental effects on our lifestyle. I think this is a good start. It's part of a graduated approach. And let's just, all we can hope for is that um, people will save, but also that the rain will come. Thank you. Um, sorry to interrupt you before, Linda. Uh, you went dead on my end, so it might have just been my okay. device. No um, so that, I take that as a comment uh, rather than a question. Um, we move to uh, Councillor Angela Dalton. Thank you, Your Worship, and the questions have been good. So just a couple of comments from me. Um, I, I support what Officer was saying, or Councillor Collins was saying, regarding how different areas are doing, because we're, we're a bit competitive, and um, we've shown that, you know, as a nation through COVID, I guess, trying to get towards a goal. 
Um, but even more than that, um, even listening to the 30% saving um, at, at your house and me thinking, actually, I think I could do better than 30%. So I don't know, you know, if there's any opportunity to get a competitive thing going on throughout Auckland. Um, I was speaking over the back fence to my neighbour a couple of weeks ago. She's in her 80s, um, and she had not, she did not know that we were that there was a drought. And she recall, she reflected back to how it must have been um, a couple of droughts ago that. The way she knew was from TV, and I'm assuming that we don't have a budget to do ads on TV for when things get really tough. But I wonder how we do reach some of our people. So a neighbour who would would likely water her garden, and um, that's what we're trying to restrict right now. She did get on social media through COVID, so you know it's not that she's not on social media, uh, but still not missing the, the marketing and comms. And so how can we perhaps reach um, the community that we're not reaching around the drought restrictions? Thank you. Thank you. A comment from Mark or Ravine on that? Uh, certainly we are looking to uh, increase the uh, channels that are currently used. Uh, in addition to the uh, straight advertising and communications campaign, we have been undertaking research, and the research helps guide um, the, the content of the, of the communications so that we're, it's being understood, but also to uh, assess reach. Now, the uh, information we've had back from the latest survey indicates that there has been a widespread reach of the message and the understanding to conserve water, but quite clearly, uh, by that example, we haven't got hold of everybody yet. So I think we'll just uh, take that uh, point and look to see what we can do, particularly perhaps for uh, uh, elderly community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and I like the competitive idea, Angela. I think the leaders at the moment are councillors Cashmore, myself, and councillor Walker, who use our own water off our roofs. But uh, if you can beat that, zero use on drawdown on water care reticulation, uh, you'll be doing well. Um, councillor Chris Darby. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ravine and, and Mark. Um, Ravine, um, in your conversation here today, you, you talked about... Um, Looking at options, um, and you listed a few different options there, um, I'm aware that those options were highlighted some two decades ago. So my question is, are you receiving a really clear direction from Auckland Council through the statement of intent and getting a clear direction from your board that there is a requirement to look at a, a climate resilient water strategy Taking into account not 93, 94, but more recently 2013 where we had a drought, 2017 Tasman Tempest, 2019 the reactive restrictions of last year to drought, and 2020 currently a major drought. Now this could have a calamitous effect on our recovery from COVID as industry fires up. And I'm also mindful of um, this too, which I'd like you to comment on. The, the per capita dom domestic water uh, consumption in the last five years is completely static. It's, in fact, it's gone up slightly, but let's say it's static from 154 litres per day to 156, 158. So I'm, my question to you, Ravine, is there a really serious intent to look past big ticket infrastructure and look at innovative, smart solutions, demand management like we haven't done before at Watercare? Or is this just a, a 2020 reaction? Thank, thank you, Councillor Darby. Um, in terms of whether we are getting clear directions from the Council, I would say yes. Uh, Yes, we are getting clear directions, um, and not just through the SOI, but also I think when we are doing presentations, the quarterly reports, wherever the discussion around uh, demand or climate change comes up, you know, the, 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 the intentions are reinforced. Well, definitely where I've been attending the meeting. So I would say that the, the intentions are very clear. Whether it is taken seriously by the board, I would say yes. Um, I think the challenge for us is how to do this um, in terms of the supply side. 
I think the challenge for us is how to do this in an environment um, in New Zealand where we've got legislative uh, drivers that are probably outdated. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the RMA. I'm talking about what, what can be done in the household because we believe that the per capita demand is, is not going to drop much more um, unless there is something that the, the consumers are given that they can do in their households. The, the concepts are in, individually they are easy to understand, but in execution they have to be done in a collective manner. What I mean by that is currently our tap water is extremely low cost to the extent that any other source of water is more expensive. Right. In fact, you know the the Stonefields purple pipe system that I mentioned earlier, uh, to get that into the homes is more expensive than our tap water is, right? And and then you have to ask your question: Well, what is why is that? And that is because our tap water is too cheap, uh, and so it raises this whole issue about pricing and tariff structures and signals to consumers. You know, should we? use economic signals uh, during summer because our summer demand went up? Uh, can we have smart metering and then smart pricing? And is, uh, is society ready for that? So I think the answer to your question, uh, Councillor Darby, is that we, despite the fact that the signals have been there and water care is keen, we probably need a workshop. And uh, Mayor Goff and my chair, we've talked about it that you know, at one of the workshops with councillors, we would very much like to do this strategy, which is all inclusive about you know, pricing, behavior changes, supply demand, do we keep investing, what do we do? And I think that would be very helpful for us to put us all on the same page as to what our vision is, what is the vision for Auckland, and then what are the steps and the timetable and what is the urgency, how quickly do we want to get there, what is the cost and what is the priority, and then we'll get on and do it. Thank you. I think that's, uh, that's a good idea, and we should, uh, should organise uh, that workshop accordingly. Uh, Councillor Alf Filipina. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, Ravine, firstly, thank you uh, for the advice and information when I uh, went on the interview with Radio Watia uh, on Tuesday. So, look, my question centred on that particular interview I had, and um, will we, uh, from the 16th of May, uh, depending on uh, the decision being made, uh, will we end up, or will the communication that goes out to our community include uh, what we've just seen with the PowerPoint around Stage 1, Stage 2, because I think it's important um, having a chart instead of the, the release that's that will be going out or has gone out. So that's the first question on, and I have one other after that, Your Worship. Thank you, Elf. Uh, Ravine, Mark. So, so as, um, as I, so, sorry, Councillor, as I understand the question, it, it, um, will we be um, uh, advising uh, Aucklanders what the uh, proposed restrictions are going to be. And, and if that's, sorry, if that's the question, yes is the answer. So, so whilst we'll be having uh, um, a communication campaign which will be uh, um, uh, requiring or requesting voluntary res res um, uh, savings, there will be also a, a more public notice style uh, uh, communication campaign which is uh, advertising the impending restrictions should they be accepted today, and that will be going uh, commencing immediately and ahead of 16 May, and then following on from 16 May, it will continue so that people understand those restrictions are being imposed. And will um, elected members be getting uh, a fact sheet in regards to those in, in the event there's more interviews? I know that. Um, Councillor Cooper is the spokesperson and, and others, but I've already had one and been approached by two others. Um, will there be a fact sheet coming out for us um, when we end up being asked to go on interviews? And uh, also, what advice are you giving uh, pool homeowners 
in regards to uh, the pools they have? Mm. Yes. Yes, so, so to answer your first question, yes, there will be an information uh, uh, pack uh, that will be circulated um, so to hopefully provide the information that you require. If there's something more that's uh, necessary, just to, um, contact Water Care and we can make sure that that information is provided without delay. And then once again with regards to the uh, pool owners, that uh, the use of swimming pools and how they are uh, um, uh, utilised going forward, that would be a subject of, of the uh, communication campaign. Perhaps um, maybe less relevant uh, in the middle of winter, but should the restrictions continue uh, into into spring and summer, it would be more and more relevant at that point as well. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. That was a good point. And some of those slides on uh, your show, Mark, um, you know, that'd be good for councillors and myself to use on social media. I think, particularly that graph on the Hunua Ranges where we collect most of our water, uh, that that highlights what the challenge is. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Chris Fletcher. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm very pleased to hear from Ravine and Mark today. And like Mark, I've been around these issues since the crisis back in 1993. And I um, just want to remind people that it was highly controversial at the time, but the matter of charging for water hugely influenced um, usage and promoted greater conservation. So I'd say uh, while we've got a crisis at the moment, don't waste it. It's a good crisis uh, situation to do things a little bit differently. Um, can I just ask you two questions? One relates to the messaging around hygiene with COVID. Um, I know with my grandchildren, I would encourage them to use less water, but then they say, oh gosh, Nanny, you're so inconsistent because the next thing you're telling us to wash our hands longer. So that's one question. The second question relates to um, an issue that Councillor Simpson uh, asked, and that is around um, commercial use. I, th I think we are going to see a lot of unemployment and we want to see people taking uh, self-initiatives. Um, I know already people are sending notes to say, would you like your house painted? Um, and we don't want to discourage people um, getting, getting out there and, and creating employment for themselves. Can you talk specifically to how, what initiatives you can put in place uh, to assist the commercial people who might want to go and paint houses where generally there's a chem wash or something beforehand or a bit of water blasting. Um, I don't want to see this as punitive. I, I want to see it as enabling. So I just would welcome your comments on that. Thank you. Sure, I'll touch on both of those uh, questions. So the first one with respect to uh, hand washing and increased uh, sanitation in these uh, challenging COVID times, uh, a very early uh, party that we spoke to was Auckland Regional Public Health Services and uh, they are very aware of our uh, water stake, uh, water lake storage lake levels and the need to impose restrictions. Uh, they are supportive of imposing restrictions, but have asked us to ensure that our communications still encourage uh, good hygiene. That's an absolute imperative. There will always be water available for health and safety requirements, and quite specifically, the uh, restrictions, uh, well, what's not being restricted is the use of water for, for health and safety requirements. So as a, for instance, a, a commercial water blaster would still be able to be engaged to water blast a pathway if it had moss on it and there was a risk of an elderly person slipping on it. So, so um, health and safety is excluded from restrictions. Uh, um, to answer your question around innovation and, and house painting and things of those uh, ilk, so in the first instance, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be working very closely with Council's Healthy Water Team uh, to uh, increase the availability of non-potable supply as an alternate. But I think the other thing that, that uh, where innovation may occur is looking for alternate forms of cleaning houses. Now, um, a single case in point, uh, um, I had a, a property that needed to be uh, painted and uh, rather than get the hose out, it took me somewhat longer, but I quite literally did it with a, a bucket of soapy water and a cloth. 
um, <laughs> I'm not sure whether everyone would be able to do that, but there's, there, I think there are other options that we would be challenging people to consider. Thank you. I've, I've done the same thing myself, using a bit of Janola as well. But I, I really appreciate your response. I think that is part of the messaging that we have to get out, that we're not trying to in any way inhibit uh, people taking uh, self-initiative. Um, and can I just again congratulate uh, you both, uh, particularly Ravine, whenever you are in charge of a project like this, I always have complete confidence. So thanks for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, don't take President Trump's advice on what you use Janola for to kill COVID-19. Um, AMSB member To Henere. To, are you there? Oh, oh no yes, question. I sorry. No, I haven't. <laughs> uh, okay, my my sound system's not is working imperfectly today. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, Councillor Shane Shane Henderson. Uh, kia ora, Mr. Mayor. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, and so I've got three questions today, and kind of following on with Councillor Darby's points and a lot of them. Uh, but firstly, I note in the report that Watercare is working with business. Now, I've been approached by the water blasting industry, who obviously um, will be a bit upset about what's happening, um, and have started uh, have stated to me that they're part of the supply chain for other industries. Um, so my question today is, how are you communicating with this industry? Sure, we've um, uh, been communicating directly in the first instance with representatives that have uh, telephoned us and emailed us, and quite clearly they have uh, have, have had some concerns. Um, I think they've been monitoring um, lake storage levels and um, that they were probably one of the earlier parties to raise the question, you know, were restrictions coming, and if restrictions were coming, how would they be affecting them? So in the first instance, it's been that form of direct communication, but uh, depending on yeah, Council's yeah. resolutions today, uh, we have uh, communications uh, primed to go out to them, those that we're aware of and have uh, both email addresses or physical addresses, and there'll be a form of uh, communication going directly to them. Cool, thank you. Um, that's good to hear. Now, uh, the second question I have is that I would argue, like, like Councillor Darby has argued, I, I believe, that this is not necessarily unforeseeable. Uh, although the scale of the drought is, is much harsher than we might have thought, um, we've been having droughts all the time. Um, and with the stalking horse of climate change, um, I do have questions around the planning for water care um, for these occurrences going on. Um, so it does seem like we've been talking about squeezing the demand side, um, and I think we'll talk about pricing another day. Um, but there, there are limited gains given that Auckland's already doing very well as a city on the demand side. Has there been planning on the supply side given climate change? And can you talk us through a couple of initiatives? Sure, I can, I can talk to that. So, so I guess the first part of, um, of um, timing for the next source of water is when it's required. And um, this, this might be uh, slightly complicated, but I'll try and explain it as, as succinctly as I can. So the, the, um, I, I talked earlier about the uh, security of Auckland's water supply and the volume of water that's available, and that's dictated by the amount of water that's available in a one in 200 year drought. So if we had a drought of that magnitude occur, we've got the ability to draw 482 million litres of water per day from the system throughout that drought. Before restrictions commence, so you know, our normal demand over summer, the average annual demand was only 440 million litres of water per day. So, so we have sufficient water to meet the requirements of a one in 200 year drought. The challenge we face though is this drought has all the potential to be the worst drought on record. How severe it is, we won't know until it's over. So the purpose of restrictions and voluntary savings are to eke out the, the water supply that we have. And as Ravine mentioned earlier, the issue is not lack of infrastructure, it's purely lack of rain. And, and then following on from that question, in terms of increasing resilience, that was one of the big drivers of selecting the Waikato as the source of water in the late 1990s. And that source 
uh, was uh, commissioned in 2002 and has been expanded five times since then and is currently undergoing its final expansion in this phase up to 175 million litres of water. To in uh, increase resilience in the short to medium term, Watercare lodged a resource application to uh, expand the capacity or essentially to double the capacity from that plant and as Ravine mentioned earlier, in the future I think, uh, I think alternate resilient sources of water will also be required to be uh, uh, reviewed and that includes the potential for reuse and desalination. But both of those options will require, or in particular reuse, does require statutory change. The drinking water provisions in New Zealand just don't um, provide for those alternate sources of water at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, one final question. Um, and just to kind of reiterate that, yeah, I want us to talk more about the supply side uh, rather than the demand side, and it seems like that's been a problem for a long time. Um, we've heard today around looking at things like the reuse of purified wastewater. Now, I have a question around this. Have Watercare taken advice uh, from a tikanga perspective about this? It, it, no, not at this stage. I mean, uh, the potential for uh, reuse of wastewater is very, very early in its infancy and um, within our current asset management plan, our published asset management plan, it's not something that was was envisaged until the very end of the uh, the end of that that uh, thirty year horizon. So, so depending on the uh, direction that comes from the uh, strategic review that Ravine and um, and his worship the mayor were talking about earlier, uh, uh, there may be a need to accelerate that. But um, at this stage, it was something that was in the future, and so no, that advice hasn't been sought as yet. Thank you. Thank you. It may be more than tikanga that um, provides a psychological barrier to uh, reuse of uh, purified wastewater, but um, that's not to say that we should not consider it. I think it's um, the ultimate in, um, uh, in recycling, actually. Um, it probably doesn't pay to think too deeply about it, however. Um, Councillor Richard Hills. Uh, kia ora, and thanks to the Watercare team. Um, the, yeah, first of all, just a, I might just do my comment and questions. Um, in one go and then ignore me if you go around again. The, um, the communications have been pretty... not going around again, so it is comments and questions together. Okay, good. Um, so the communications have been really good. I remember two years ago hassling you uh, pretty strongly, Ravine, for not having any social media presence, and now um, the Facebook and Twitter I've seen. The, the, the messaging are really fantastic, and lots of people are sharing it, and it's starting to um, really help with that clear messaging. Um, the other thing is the FAQs. If those could keep getting added to, they're really good on the website, but I see some common themes and your team answering them on uh, online and, and other councillors answering them too. If those could keep being added to that long list uh, when common things comes up, like what are you doing about uh, the future of dams and why is this happening and uh, those sorts of things, it's just a lot easier for us to answer a few questions and throw up that FAQ list, um, which is very, it's quite clear at the moment, but if you keep adding to that. The other thing is the, I think people are probably quite um, sick of telling on each other or, or a little bit uh, dealing with the COVID situation. So if we could potentially proactively go out and say, these are the numbers you call, but please don't put on Facebook. We have a habit in our community for, you know, it's like dogs and, Every, uh, speeding and everything else, people seem to put it straight on the community Facebook pages with people quite visible. Um, if you could proactively say the only way Watercare will follow it up if you ring or email this, you know, please do not put on social media because it can create some pretty nasty bullying and quite. And I think people are pretty, um, uh, you know, it's pretty hard for people at the moment as well uh, through this situation. So if you could be a bit more proactive about exactly how and what not to do um, that would help, because I think, yeah, telling on your neighbours for watering their gardens. And the other thing is the messaging might get a little bit confused. So obviously we all want to be saving water, but is the only, um, so will there be two messages around what we legally can't do, such as watering the gardens, but you'll be doing a separate message about generally saving water? Because I think if people start thinking, like uh, Councillor Cooper or someone said that, 
we might be monitoring your showers, it, it's going to get complicated. And those are okay. my comments, and thank you very much. It's um, not going to be easy, but uh, you may want to answer those or email me. I, I, I certainly appreciate the support. We, we certainly appreciate the support. I'll answer the last question first. Uh, uh, yes, the intention was to separate out the um, more uh, public notice type um, communications and, and the mandatory restrictions as opposed to the more voluntary uh, uh, things and winning the hearts and minds of 1.7 million Aucklanders to support us and, and help us out through this drought. Uh, um, and your other points uh, regarding use of social media I think is very, very wise and uh, we will look to, uh, look to try and encourage that however practically we can. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tracy Mulholland. Yeah, thank you, uh, Your Worship, and thank you to all of the team that have done a lot of work on this. Uh, I just would like to share with you a couple of things. Uh, one is a consideration, please, and I would like to take this offline if that's um, appropriate and happy to do that. In the old Waitakere days, uh, we used to put in tanks that um, caught all of the reef water for minor dwellings. Now, those tanks, in a lot of cases, as you are well aware, were not allowed to be, the water was not allowed to be used, and a drainage system had to be installed so that it slowly, the water slowly um, came out of the tank. I would like to see us revert to um, having our community be allowed to use that water for gardening or other purposes. So I'd like some commentary on that, and um, if possible, um, uh, an email back to me on that matter so I can share it with community because I do think that is wasted water. Um, so that's the first one. So if you would come back on that, please. And the other one is um, we're, with regards to 5% savings, there are people um, like myself, many singles, who actually do make a lot of effort to uh, minimise water use I, anyway. I can hear Disappear. Sorry, just some interruption of people. We're getting some interruption. I think it might be at your end, Ravine. Um, so, if we can just watch that, please. Uh, Tracy, you were just going to ask the second question. Thank you, Your Worship. Just with regards to that, the singles. There is a lot of um, people who are singles, and I've got a lot of elderly neighbours, and myself being maybe young who do make a lot of effort with regards to saving water anyway. So I think a 5% restriction, um, you know, is asking a lot of those people, just an awareness, point two, that was. Now point three, you as an organisation provided these wonderful small little um, timers, four-minute timers for showers, and I gave away about five of those. They were left in the councillor's office. Uh, prior to lockdown, and I would like to ask that you make some of those available. Now, how they get sent out, I don't know, but I've had very, very good feedback about that. Maybe not so much that every time you get in the shower, you look at water care um, as a brand, because it's branded, of course, but they're really good um, barometers of a four-minute shower. <laughs> So, and also, I'm sorry, but I don't agree with having any sort of competition because I think that brings about struggles with people who are being sincere and legitimate. Um, so I think we're better off just to encourage the use of social media, and I support Councillor Hills with regards to um, the part of sharing online. I think people will say what they want to say anyway online. That's just the social media aspect of it. So the tank... The 5% savings for singles, just an awareness, it seems quite restrictive for those that are doing a good job, and the four-minute timers, and um, if you could respond to that. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Your Mark. I'll just cover off each of those. I, I would also do it in reverse order as well. I think those shower timers are wonderful. I, I, I use them uh, in, in our own shower and also uh, for my children, and that contributed to the 30% uh, reduction in demand. Um, I think it's also a great idea. I'm just not sure of the availability of them, but I think that's something we will certainly be looking for as to whether we can source more and make a greater number available. Uh, with respect 
to the 5% savings. As I mentioned, that's an overall target. It's extremely difficult for us to uh, measure and monitor that at an individual uh, household level because clearly um, there will be changes that may occur in the household which we won't be aware of. So, so uh, any target that we uh, publish would be at a region-wide level and tracking in terms of publicity would be at a region-wide level. And so I certainly take your point on there. And finally, with respect to uh, uh, utilisation of rainwater tanks, I think that's probably a, a subject for a, a council to uh, consider and resolve because I, I actually think it's probably outside of the, the bailiwick of, 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 of water care. Thank, thank you very much for that. Councillor Daniel Newman. Um, yes, um, good morning, Ravine, and good morning, Mark, and thank you for the work that you're doing. I had three questions. Um, with respect to Hayes Creek, that's an existing dam and it's full of water. The Environment Court granted consent um, for the taking of water from that dam in 1998, and I understand that consent does not expire until December 2031. So really going to Shane Henderson's point here. Now, the water treatment plant for Hayes Creek Dam was decommissioned, I understand, in 1995, uh, sorry, 2005. And to me, it's been apparent that Watercare's management has been advising the board. Um, I'm not quite sure why there has been uh, a long delay uh, in getting a package plant online to take water from a consented dam source, um, very hard to consent dams, but we've got an existing dam uh, where we could source water. So why, uh, why are we um, moving now to source water from that dam um, through a package plant when in fact we've had consent to take water from that dam for such a long time? That's my first question, please. Sure. sure. Um, I think I'll probably best better place to answer that question than Ravine, uh, Councillor Newman. Um, you're quite correct about the uh, consent, and, and that's why it's a source that we can bring online very, very quickly. The Hayes Creek Dam was take. Uh, sorry, the Hayes Creek. Uh, water treatment plant was taken out of commission because it was unable to meet the uh, more stringent drinking water standards. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, from a, a, a supply side viewpoint, the current yield of all of our dams is significantly in, in excess of the demand. Uh, um, but the situation we find ourselves in now is directly as a result of lack of rainfall. And that's why the, the planned uh, reintroduction of that uh, water treatment plant is being accelerated. And also it's actually being expanded. So originally what was planned to do with the Hayes Creek uh, new water treatment plant was to put in a plant of similar size to what it was before, which matched the, the, the yield of that uh, supply. It's quite unique. It's a very, very small dam, represents about 1% of total storage, but it's quite an unusual catchment, and it, its catchment characteristics are very affected by rainfall. So over the summer months, it, because it's got relatively small storage, but you do have the ability to mine that lake and draw it down quite quickly. And then over the winter months, you, you would also have the ability to be able to utilise those flushes of water from that accelerated rainfall. So what was originally planned was a very, very modest and small uh, 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 water treatment plant, but uh, what we're proposing to put in there now is something that's uh, somewhat uh, in excess of two times the size of what was originally proposed, and that will be uh, looking to be operational ahead of summer this year. Uh, thank you, Mark. Look, I wanted to I wanted to have a follow up questions actually with the chair of the Board of Water Care because, to me, in relation to a bylaw, this really needs to be a governance to governance conversation. Um, but the chair's not available today, so I just want to just follow up on this um, with you in the absence of of Ms. Devlin being available. Um, look, understanding the need for the appropriate plant technology. Um, you know, it's apparent that this was a matter which has been discussed as part of a business casing exercise for some time now. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure why, why this work um, didn't actually take place 
um, to get that plant online three years ago because what I understand <clears throat> based on what Watercare has advised me in response to the questions that I've asked put to you is that if we had had the Hayes Creek Dam um, online it would have you know, in 2018 for example we would have had uh, a cumulative um, positive benefit of, of 3% for the region which which in the context of now would, would have been very useful so um, understanding that that we have pro we've focused first um, on conservation and, and talking to Aucklanders about restrictions uh, um, what I mean how, how, how much faster can we go to get that um, that plant built and online for a consented source because I you know we, I feel like this this work should have actually taken place about three years ago understanding that we have an abundance of water in a reasonable year but we don't have the water supply this year but I would have thought that we want to have protect our sources um, and have all um, sources available for these tough times and we don't at the moment so, so I, I think I think um, what I was um, trying to explain uh, councillor Newman is that the scale of the of this uh, proposed treatment plant that we'll be putting in now is significantly larger than what would have been installed had something been put in earlier and so to give a sense of that scale it will be larger than the new Walkworth uh, water treatment plant that was recently opened so it is something of size and something of, of significant benefit but but perhaps I wonder whether the question you're proposing might be something that could be put onto the agenda of this uh, strategic uh, water resource uh, uh, workshop that was uh, uh, promoted earlier uh, thank you Cliff I can get you to come to your third question please Daniel I'm just conscious of time and uh, I've still yeah. got probably another six speakers thank you yeah, look, well, I won't, I won't do a question, Your Worship. Look, what I'll do, perhaps, perhaps if we have that workshop, we can have the Water Care Board attend that workshop. I think that would be appropriate from a governance to governance perspective. From my perspective, I think that, that Mark and the team are doing the very best they can under these circumstances to get this technology um, up so that we can get all sources tapped. To me, um, it, it just seems it's difficult to go and ask the community to make savings um, because we have a, a, a crisis in terms of our current supply of water when we have a dam which is full of water but remains untapped despite the fact that we have consent. So when we have that workshop, yeah, if we could have a, a further discussion about that particular plant technology, but I do think that the, the, the Water Care Board needs to be present because this needs to be a joined up conversation. It seems to me this, com this discussion about this technology has been ongoing for some time, but we're only accelerating it now and, and it feels to me like we're, we're running behind time. Thank you, and it's good to know that that will be operational by this summer. My farm feeds into that creek directly. Um, Councillor Greg Sayers. Are you there, Greg? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Your Worship, uh, and good morning, Mark and Ravine. Um, just for you, Your Worship, um, I'll probably just put my comments and my questions together. I'm probably looking for three answers, but I totally support the recommendation in terms of the um, uh, restrict, restrictions that have been um, alluded to. Um, probably my questions and comments is around the supply levers uh, that Mark was addressing. So, Mark, um, basically, you know, I'm re I was really pleased to hear from from Ravine about the uh, investigations into. Um, you know, alternative sources of fresh water, like through desalination and the treatment of, of the wastewater. Um, I'm just, and that there's somebody working on that. I'd, I'd be curious to know who's the team leader of that exercise. Um, and it's probably in relation to, um, are they, I'd like to link up with them and understand if they're looking at uh, new dams. I think there was one mentioned a few years ago in the rural area of Riverhead as a possibility. I know the Auckland Regional Authority did a study in the Dome Valley um, up, up there as well. Um, so that would be that'd be helpful to understand if those are still being explored as part of the overall um, strategies. Um, secondly, 
Uh, probably uh, picking up on Councillor Newman's comments, you know, it's, it seems to be um, one of a better word dragging out to try and get these new supply sources in place. So um, in terms of the, I read on page 12 that we are engaged with the Waikato Iwi uh, in terms of our applications. I'd like to know, um, know where we are. I think there were, I think from memory there's about 96 applications. I, you know, where do we sit in that? Have we come to the topic queue and when may we actually you know, achieve a result there and a green light is really my question. And finally, in terms of the capital costs of a new water extraction plant, um, wherever it may be, and also the cost of the pipeline that needs to be run um, through to, to the different plants, Redout Road or wherever it needs to go, um, do we have an idea of those capital costs and do we have a feel of ago and and because that application has been sitting waiting to be processed for that long we've had to refresh that option evaluation assessment in anticipation of a hearing uh, of that application so we have updated it since then but nonetheless there were in excess or uh, almost I think it was 98 different options so almost a hundred different alternate sources that were considered, and they included uh, uh, dams within the Auckland region, uh, dams outside of the Auckland region, tapping into underground sources outside of the Auckland region, as well as surface sources of water. Mm -hmm. But uh, and uh, and more specifically, both desalination and reuse were considered at that stage as well. And, and yes, you're quite right. There was proposed to be a dam uh, uh, to be built within the uh, uh, Riverhead uh, forest area. That utilised uh, water. For, it's unlike our existing dams in the Hunuas, for instance, which are high on a hill and literally dam a stream and water builds up behind it. What was proposed in Riverhead was uh, damming a dry river valley and then abstracting water from two adjacent reasonably small streams and filling it up. But ultimately, the yield of that source just wasn't sufficient to meet future growth requirements, and uh, uh, the Waikato option was then selected. Uh, uh, if I come back to the last question, which was uh, capital cost and pipeline, so one of the reasons the Waikato option was selected is because it can be developed in stages, and in developing it in stages is extremely economic. So the first stage could see uh, 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 the plant increase in capacity by about 50%. So it could go from its current 150 to something in the order of about 225 or 250 million litres. And, and the advantage of that is that water can be pushed through the existing pipeline. We can make modifications to that pipeline to increase the rate in which that water can be passed through it, so defer the capital cost of that pipeline, which is significant. But as growth occurs, so post the 2030s and into the 2040s, um, then the second pipeline would be built and then the plant uh, capacity expanded once again. And then the last question in terms of where are we in the processing queue, there, uh, as of the 24th of April, we were uh, 96, there was 95 applicants ahead of ours. Most of those applicants are reasonably small and should be dealt with reasonably quickly. However, there are two very, very large irrigators that are ahead of us and uh, uh, addressing their uh, consent applications, we're advised, may take some time. Uh, thank you for those uh, those questions, uh, Councillor Sayers. Um, I have written to the Minister now twice 
pointing out the inadequacies of the Resource Management Act that means that something as fundamental as a, the guaranteeing the supply of water to 1.6 million people would have to stand behind uh, you know, 96 other applications after seven years. It's quite unacceptable and I'll continue to follow up with the Minister. The Act needs to be changed. Uh, Councillor, Sharon, yeah. Councillor Sharon Stewart. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Ravine, I just want to thank you and Mark and all your team for everything that you've been doing. One of the things that um, I have discussed with you before is the water leaks. And I know the um, water leaks on private property are very hard for you to deal with. And I think after talking to um, some of your staff, the only way we can deal, you can really deal with this is we have to get... Um, Auckland Council to seek some urgent legislation from central government so water care can go onto private property to uh, fix leaks because often some of the private property could be people that are living overseas or whatever. Um, these leaks can go on for many months and if some, in some cases even years. A lot of water is lost because of that. Um, would, you, would you like for us today to make um, some sort of recommendation to central government um, to get legislation for um, water care to be able to go into private property and to be able to build the pri private property if you know they've been given a bit of notice to, to fix and if they haven't fixed after some time water care can go onto private property and and um, fix that's one of, one of the questions and the other, the other one is um, just following on from what Councillor Hills was talking about with um, uh, email address, maybe something like water restrictions at watercare.co.nz. That could be somewhere that people could report if they see somebody um, doing something illegal, using a hose, whatever. And just another, another thing is at what level will the drought restrictions be lifted and, and go back to normal? Thank you. Okay, I, um, I'll answer uh, those in, uh, in reverse order because that's probably a little e easier. So in terms of um, the, the restrictions being lifted, the reverse order will just follow the um, same as the trigger levels in the drought management plan. Now the drought management plan does offer just a little bit of flexibility and I think we would need to observe that flexibility because I think the last thing we'd want is to be hunting in and out of restrictions. If, if the forecast, if we, if, if we have a very wet spell and we uh, uh, rise just above uh, uh, the stage one trigger levels and they would normally be withdrawn, but the forecast uh, is for less than average rainfall and the weather conditions are very sunny and it, and it seems very obvious that we're going to drop back down into it, our recommendation would be not to remove those restrictions. But in general accordance, with the, uh, with the drought management plan, they'd be lifted in exactly the same order based on those seasonal lake levels. Um, just with respect to the um, email, establishing the email address, there'll be a variety of means and channels open for people to report both leaks and, um, and uh, people not complying with our request for these, uh, both uh, voluntary savings and mandatory savings. And then just with respect to water leaks, I, th I think uh, Council probably already has power to undertake that activity. So um, I, I, I certainly speak w uh, under correction by, by others, uh, um, but I would be surprised if any requirement, if there is any requirement to seek anything further from uh, um, central government at this stage, because so as I understand it, Auckland Council's warranted staff can enter onto private property uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, IMSB Chair David Taipari. Oh, kia ora, Your Worship. Uh, my first part, uh, Your Worship, is uh, more relating to the report of item 13, in particular around the uh, Māori impact statement. Uh, and I look at paragraphs 52, 53 of that report, um, which is basically a, a duplication of the financial implications. Uh, and so I'm assuming that under the local board impacts, uh, 
where paragraph 50 and 51 is actually the Māori impact statement. Uh, so I think that whoever authorised the report um, needs to be um, putting those into the right space um, so we get um, good information. Uh, my question is um, around the uh, Waikato iwi uh, terminology. Uh, my thoughts would be it would be iwi who have an interest with the Waikato River. Uh, and what I would like, uh, not necessarily now, but an e by email or something, is a comprehensive list of those iwi that have an interest with the Waikato River that have been uh, engaged with. Uh, also, um, there's a statement about uh, where uh, marae and uh, uh, Māori land that is connected to the network supply, uh, they will um, be uh, required to uh, do stage one restrictions. Uh, I just thought it was sort of leaving a bit ambiguous for those who aren't, and I picked up you talking about yourself, Your Worship, saying uh, you, we should all be on that. Um, so I just thought the impact statement could have actually uh, uh, recognise the fact that those who are uh, not on network supply won't be um, required to do the restrictions. Uh, there's also a matter raised about uh, the Kaitiaki Forum being kept up to date. Uh, what I would like to know is, uh, what is what was the method used to update uh, that forum? Uh, and if it was a meeting, uh, was everyone present? So if we could have some evidence of that, I would appreciate it. So there's a bunch of things there that I feel can be uh, sent to me in written form via email. Thank you. Um, thank you, David. Um, Sarah, probably those questions are best directed towards you in terms of it being the uh, Council's paper. Is there anything you want to comment on now, or do you just want to uh, correspond directly um, with, uh, with Chair Taipere? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, yes, obviously there was a, a word processing mistake in there, um, so apologies about that. But um, I will take those um, and, and come back to you directly, um, Chair Taipari. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Wayne Walker. Yeah. Um, hi, Phil. Um, I've got some comments to make. The, the first thing I'd like to do, though, is just speak to uh, the item and the motions. And my particular concern, and I draw the attention of councillors to this, if you look at the motions, um, in the main they're all negative. That is, we're asking restrictions not to do this, not to do that, not to do the other. That applies to residential and commercial. The other point that I'd make is that as much and all as this is a presentation from water here, uh, as, um, as the speaker said, the council can decide to do things and reference particularly water tanks. So I would like some additions and they are positive and they go like this and Sandra might like to note these down. Encourage water savings domestically and commercially. I wouldn't have thought there was a problem with that. Encourage the uptake of water tanks. I wouldn't have thought there was a problem with that. Investigate the provision of water savings and water storage devices. I'll repeat that. Investigate the provision of water saving and water storage devices. And I'll, I'll just speak to some of these things quickly in no particular order. Um, obviously, the Water for Life um, uh, site is great. There's no mention on that site, uh, or if there is, they're scant. I can't find it around water tanks and things that um, people can do domestically or commercially in that respect. I can't find anything that would be desirable. In this instance, we're at odds with almost every state in Australia that's well documented in encouraging the use of water tanks, grey water recycling and others. I'm familiar with the Becker study back in 2015 that's got severe limitations in terms of being reliant on um, and largely discounts um, water tanks. Um, I'm at odds with that and I could speak to that. Uh, just by way of background, on a personal level I've been active in this issue over 30 years. Back in the water crisis in 94, 
I was on national television every night because parts of my house, the whole house was on a water conservation diet. I was engaged in retrofitting for large clients such as Auckland Hospital to meet water conservation requirements. And I designed and was developing a whole range of products, water conservation products that um, were very popular at the time. And I've continued to take an, an interest prior to then and ever since. Some other comments, the provision of smart meters, the provision of more connections for water tankers, because that has been a problem in the present um, circumstance, particularly on the Hibiscus Coast and elsewhere. And I think the Council should also be revisiting its water strategy because there are concepts that we could and should be promoting, such as the concept of self-sufficiency for water in New Zealand. And in that respect, and I'm mindful of the comments that Councillor Darby made, for example, if we look at the Waikato, the Waikato draws its water from Taupo. Taupo draws its water from the snow feed and associated feed in the catchment, including Ruapehu. Now, Niwa is predicting snowfalls are going to decrease, and the central plateau is a hot spot from a climate change perspective, and there will be reduced water falling in that area. So the notion that the Waikato is a very long-term substitute is in itself a problem. And we should be having information around all of these things and considering the totality of them. So they're the comments that I'd make, um, Mr. Mr. Mayor. In passing, I just make the um, comment that there's no requirement in new developments other than a few locations um, for the installation of um, water tanks. Um, so I, I just bring your attention back to those um, additions that I'm putting. I'll repeat them. Encourage water savings domestically and commercially, encourage the uptake of water tanks, investigate the provision of water savings, water saving and water storage devices. Investigate the provision of water saving and water storage devices. Um, just by way of uh, information, that could include dramatically encouraging the use of flow restrictors, low flow shower heads, and there are a number of things that can structurally impact on water savings in a household. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Walker. Um, look, I've received a, a, a number of uh, amendments and we're just trying to um, group them into two categories. Uh, I think uh, something that was raised right at the beginning um, by Ravine, the concept of having a, a joint workshop, I think is a good one where we need to work through issues like um, making sure our water supply is resilient with climate change, uh, plus the, the range of other measures that could be put in place. Um, what we're looking at today are recommendations purely around um, the mandatory restrictions. Um, but, but obviously our discussion has gone much wider than that. Um, I am in favour of having a workshop and uh, I'm just working with Councillor uh, Darby at the moment. Um, he just wants to build that into the uh, recommendations, and I'm happy to uh, accept that. And I had a, um, also a, a, another recommendation from Councillor Watson, and uh, uh, there's been discussion between Councillor Watson uh, and Megan Tyler, and we've, uh, I think we've encompassed that. Um, but, Wayne, you raised some really good points. They're all relevant. And I think those are the sort of things that we need to make the subject of the, the workshop um, and just keep the recommendations focused as they are now on the mandatory restrictions that we have to move under the bylaw. So that's what I'll be recommending uh, when we've reached the end of our, our speakers. Um, so it come so, now um, to... Thank, th thank you, Mr Mayor, but by just way of response, you don't need a, a, a workshop to understand the additions I've put up they make absolute common sense, and at some point we need to actually do stuff. Um, yep, yep. So I, I, I just seek a seconder. Thank you. Uh, thank you. What, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, Councillor. I'm simply saying these recommendations are entirely specific about what we need to do today to bring into effect mandatory restrictions. We need to do much more besides, and I think we can set that work program 
uh, out in the course of the workshop that is being proposed, and, and that would be my preferred way um, uh, of going about that. Um, Councillor John Watson. Okay, well, thanks, Mr Mayor. A couple of um, quick questions that I seek clarification on, um, and I, like a number of other councillors, have uh, got concerns over the impact on on a number of the businesses that uh, will be conceivably affected by by these restrictions, and particularly the smaller businesses. So I just would seek clarification on um, the 4.2 exemptions that appear in the Auckland Metropolitan Drought Management Plan um, as they go to building and window, window washing. So it says there that um, water efficient cleaning devices are exempt um, to protect small businesses, and that follows an earlier section talking about how high pressure water blasters are typically highly water efficient. So I'm just seeking clarification on 4.2, whether that uh, means that there is an exemption to the type of uh, businesses like Chemwash who are going around um, uh, water blasting houses either to, to clean them up, mould and almost health and safety perspective, um, or of that lane, chain of supply that Councillor Henderson referred to as part of then um, uh, an activity that then leads to other things happening in the building and further employment. So could I have a clarification on that first of all, please? Mark, would you like to address that, please? It, it's, it's certainly, Councillor. Uh, um, yes, a absolutely. The uh, restrictions as proposed, as drafted, uh, do not cover uh, the use of, for instance, a water blaster where it's being used for health and safety, emergency or biosecurity reasons. So as a, for instance, a good example might be a, a, a school about to reopen after being shut down for COVID for some period of time. It requires um, a, a thorough cleaning of uh, outdoor play equipment and contact spaces where, which the children might be touching. That's not proposed to be uh, restricted by uh, uh, the proposal that's before us. However, if the use of the water blaster was merely for, uh, for instance, aesthetic purposes, uh, uh, cleaning a driveway for aesthetic purposes as opposed to health and safety reasons, uh, that would be restricted as proposed. So that, so the effect that, the, that a, it's a water, water efficient cleaning device that's being used to clean the outside of a house then means that that, um, that is not exempt then according to your reply there. So uh, correct. So, so on, the, on the one hand, the, the management plan is saying these, these, this equipment for business use, because it's water efficient, is exempt, but you're saying that it still has to have some cue into to a health, um, a health uh, output. Yes, that, that's correct. What's proposed uh, as it stands is it uh, uh, would be restricted unless it's um, sheeted back to health, safety, emergency or biosecurity reasons. Okay, so that is going to affect the, um, the chain of supply and it's going to affect the operations of a n number of these small businesses then. So um, I, I, I'm going to speak to my, um, my uh, um, addition that you've um, kindly accepted there, Mr Mayor, if that's the case, because I think it, it picks up on a number of points councillors have made. Okay, yeah, please go ahead, John. Yeah, okay, so, um, you know, this is... All these measures, you know, needless to say, um, are needed and will be supported by Aucklanders. But in amongst all this, um, we have to be careful we don't um, provoke a perverse response here. And that perverse response um, refers to small businesses who require in this sort of activity to 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 survive. And and that that, that is, you know, alluded to in passing it. Point 56 uh, in risks and mitigations, whether it says there is a risk that stage one restrictions will affect the operation of some businesses, which could compound the economic impacts of COVID-19. There's no could about it. It will definitely compound those economic impacts. These businesses uh, haven't been working for four or five weeks. The winter is usually a slow period anyway. They're just looking to pick up their activity now. They employ uh, our fellow Aucklanders both just as, as operators within their business, but along that supply chain that uh, Councillor Henderson re replied, uh, referred to when, when he spoke. What we've heard from uh, 
water care in terms of um, communications with these people is a little less than reassuring, to be honest. It's a little vague um, if we're going to be honest about things that re you know refers to uh, working, you know, working with um, the operators and investigating uh, non-potable sources. Um, I think, Mr. Mayor, there has to be a, a clear sense of practicality in this. If there's, and, and given that the investigations into this took place 26 years ago, one would have thought that um, any investigating work would have been done long before now uh, in terms of the measures, these restrictions that we're considering here today. So if a non-potable water source is 20, 30, 40 kilometres away from the operation or the area the people are working in, it's not very useful, especially if they run out of water uh, in, in what they're doing, which I've, I've heard from some of the operators is that often they sometimes need 20 or 30 litres to finish off a job. They just don't quite have enough in their, in their storage capacity. So the non-potable investigations, unless they're reasonably close to the area of work, you know, have limited, uh, if, if any, any value then in, in the scheme of things. Um, we heard in response to some of the questions that uh, as far as the industry players go, that water care had um, had, uh, had replied to representatives who had telephoned or emailed them um, or um, communicated with those who they were aware of. Well, I've been in communication with people who, who have very little idea of what's going on, are very worried about the future of their business under these restrictions, and there doesn't seem to be any coherent communication with uh, these people either directly or with, a rep or with a representative of their group. And I think that's very important because the assurances that we have been given are rather generalised. And if we take the latest response to that 4.2, um, could, and that's in terms of what is exempt, they could be quite severely re restricted. So if some of these measures that are getting put up are really not that practical or really not that numerous, then Water Care uh, and Auckland Council and us as elected members need to be told that. So we're not fooling anyone. The last thing we want is people going out of work um, for, uh, in the case of these operators who, who use highly efficient uh, water blasting machines anyway, for you know comparatively small saving in the scheme of things. That is a perverse result, Mr. Mayor. So the only way I can see that being um, uh, avoided or mitigated is if there's clear, transparent, open lines of communication with the people directly and their representatives, not the kind of hit or miss, you know, if some email in or some get the uh, information passed on to them by their representatives. So I think that I is actually very important, and, and, and I would... Um, you know, I've tried to ascertain this week exactly what is happening with the communications between the groups, and, and you know, it has been a little hit or miss. And we're talking about people's livelihoods here. So yes, we have to do these changes. That's that's a no-brainer. But we do have to protect at this time more than any time these small business operators who rely on this activity um, to to earn their livelihood and livelihoods of their workers and other people involved in the supply chain. So I would hope that the response to that eye, to that direction, Mr. Mayor, um, is a really meaningful one and that, that Water Keel and Auckland Council really work with the people to, to make something work. And if it doesn't work, to look at some mitigation measures. Because I think if we're talking of public perception and the word public perception is used there, the public are going to be uh, supportive of keeping people in work and doing the, and, and, and these sorts of activities continuing in whatever form they need to. The savings associated with the smaller operators are you know, insignificant in the scheme of things. The last thing we want is these people going out of work. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you very much, Councillor. Yeah, look, um, I think that uh, Resolution I is, um, is important, and I think there needs to be good communication. And I don't think that we can pretend that when we put restrictions in place, it won't have an impact uh, on, on people. If it didn't have any impact, we wouldn't be putting the restrictions in place. And one of the problems we'd have, for example, if you allowed commercial water blasting uh, but didn't, didn't allow you to water blast your own home, uh, that would be inconsistent. If we don't achieve the savings and we have to close industry a day a week, 
uh, the heavy water usage industries, that will have a massive effect on the, uh, on the economy as a whole. So what we're trying to do is to put some measures up front to find the savings now in order to, event, to prevent much wider implications and much more draconian requirements uh, later on. Uh, can I come to uh, Councillor Paul Young, last speaker? Oh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just for the coming stage one water use restriction, uh, can we also work out a possible other stage, stage situation uh, if getting worse, uh, similar to the four la different level of the current lockdown, if possible? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Have you got any comment to make on, on that? Um, I'm just I was just actually making a note as to, on the prior speaker. My, my apologies, uh, Councillor Young. So, so could you repeat your question? My, my apologies. Paul, if I could just get you to repeat that question, please. Uh, no problem. Uh, because the coming stage one water use restriction, can we possible uh, to work out uh, other stage situation if the uh, water issue crisis is getting worse, uh, similar to the current uh, four different level of the lockdown? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I can, I can probably answer that, um, Councillor Young. We have got stage two, which is very similar, but uh, is a bit more restrictive uh, um, hey guys, on watering back. sports uh, fields under stage two. And there are different trigger levels. Uh, the trigger levels depend on the time of the year, but uh, at the moment, the trigger level to go to stage two, for example, is if we fall below, uh, say, 40% at the present time. And then at stage three, um, there's a trigger level for that, and, and that would be uh, where you'd, you'd largely try to work with uh, industry to get voluntary compliance, but you would have to dramatically reduce your water level usage, and that's where you might have to consider, for example, uh, cutting back um, the amount of water used by uh, water, water heavy industries, um, particularly food processing, which might mean uh, cutting down the work week to, say, a four-day week. Now, that would, that would have big economic implications, um, but we're dealing with a situation here uh, at, at that point, at level three, uh, that you are in a crisis rather than a critical situation where you're trying to preempt the crisis. So set out in the paper, uh, the, uh, in the accompanying paper from Watercare, uh, how the trigger points would, uh, would be met at, le at stage one, two and three, and what the implications of, the, uh, of reaching that level would be in terms of the restrictions imposed. So I hope that's helpful. Okay. Um, Councillors, uh, we've got so two amendments that I've accepted as the mover. I just need to check with the deputy um, uh, or the, the, the seconder of the motion, Councillor Cooper. Um, yeah, just I, I mean, intent, but we've already heard, for me, it's more about noting because we've already heard that Watercare have been working with their key customers, but I'll accept that. But I just wanted to make a comment, Mr Mayor, about the uh, something Councillor Newman said about governance to governance comms, if that's... Right. Uh, yeah, look, that, as the liaison uh, councillor, yeah, I think it's quickly, appropriate um, to take another call. Ma um, the Chair of Watercare, Margaret Devlin, has been in constant communication with myself and the Mayor over the last two or more months around this. So the Mayor and myself have been kept up to date. We just haven't had CC Oversight Committee. So that hasn't been remiss. It's been there the whole time. I just wanted to reassure people that I'm comfortable with the amendments. Okay, thank you. So we'll accept amendments I and J. So I will put those amendments collectively. Um, uh, is there a call for a division or should we do it on voices? If there's no call for voices. a division, uh, we'll take it on, on voices. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I think I can declare that carried unanimously. Thank you very much, councillors, and, and a big thank you to Ravine Jadaram and Mark Bourne. Um, we really got the benefit today um, of uh, uh, both uh, historical and institutional knowledge uh, by, by both of our presenters. Uh, that, was, uh, that was very full, very comprehensive, and, uh, and thank you for the detail in which you answered the question. So um, acknowledge uh, Watercare and thank them for their presentation and their efforts to date on this. Uh, councillors, we've taken two hours over that item. Um, I've uh, allowed that to go on because it's obviously a, a critical a, a critical step that we're taking today. Um, but 
let's try, as we work our way through the rest of the agenda, just to, to try to keep our comments as precise as possible. Uh, and that includes the, 